coming in here and um, we're just about at, we're at six o'clock. So um, we can get started this evening, which is evening for us. And I think 10 in the morning for our guests. Um, so before I uh, jump in, I'm just gonna turn it to Mark Lawrence from the Bill Nelms Pain and Research Center just to get us started this evening. Right. Well, I'd like to, first of all, uh, welcome Dr. Mark Grant, uh, who's a psychologist, uh, a clinician and a researcher from Australia. And I know someone that Madeline has always shown a great interest in, in Mark's work. And he is at the forefront of the link between trauma and pain and its treatment. So I think this is a major uh, you know, area of interest for us, a very important area to cover. And I think, you know, I'd just like to welcome Mark. It's, it's a privilege to have you um, on our webinar and we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I was just saying, you know, amazing international boundaries mean nothing anymore. We can contact people in Australia and, and uh, you know, Australia has always been at the forefront of, of the research in, in pain uh, for many, many years. I think you guys are leagues ahead of, uh, many parts of the world. I think we're just still catching up with a lot of the research. So it really is a privilege to, to have you um, with us this evening. And thank you very much from the Bull Nelms Pain and Research Center in, uh, in British Columbia. Um, so yeah, welcome to you and uh, to all the participants. I'd like to say thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining us this evening. This is again, one part of our presentation um, and patient education session. So uh, I'll hand it over to Mark and Madeline. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so as, as um, one Mark was saying, <laughs> introducing the other Mark, um, I just again would like to ex extend a welcome and also to uh, remind everybody, um, so this, this webinar is being recorded. And uh, so the recording will be sent out if you have to um, zip out or if you have to leave early. Do make yourself comfortable as best as you can for um, the next um, hour, hour and a half as we dive into this topic. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that we do treat it like, a, like an in-person class. So confidentiality um, keeps it a safe place for everybody. Uh, you know, if people share in the chat, whatever gets shared um, stays here. So um, yeah, I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Grant, who is a clinical psychologist, a researcher, a clinician, all the way from Melbourne, Australia. So it's Tuesday morning for him. And um, so Mark has, I, as, um, as Mark Lawrence said, I've, I've been following, I've uh, AKA stalking Mark Grant for many, many years and his work. And, um, and I, uh, when it came to trauma and pain, when I was really looking for um, a clear understanding of how to treat um, both um, sort of at the same time or one um, that would affect the other. And I, I found Mark's work many years ago on EMDR. And uh, so I have the his third edition um, that it's very dog-eared because I've, I've referred to it all the time, not realizing he's put out three more editions since then as well as other publications. He's been cited in the New York Times um, and uh, published research and, um, and also has an app that I'm hoping he's gonna tell us about. So um, I really appreciate his uh, uh, taking a complex topic and bringing it down to something that we can understand and we can use and um, perhaps some things that we might be able to I think he's going to give us some things to take away even tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark and um, I will we'll be stopping at the end for um, uh, questions. So um, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Madeline and Mark for the lovely introduction and the welcome. It's a pleasure to be here from all the way down under. And I'm very excited to be presenting to you and your people tonight. 
Um, I'm going to I'm going to um, not only talk about the connection between trauma and pain and why it matters. I am going to share with you um, five practical strategies tonight that uh, you can use to help control pain based on this approach. So it's not just a lot of talk tonight. Uh, I will be leaving you with some some tangible resources that you can you know reuse again and again to actually reduce your stress levels and control your pain. So I'll probably spend the first perhaps the first half an hour or so just explaining a little bit about the trauma pain connection and the role of the brain in pain, um, which is sort of two of the major developments in chronic pain in the last 20 years. And then we'll move into um, those five practical strategies that you can use to um, change your brain, change your pain. So um, to, to begin with, uh, as, you pro as probably anyone who's been in pain for any length of time already knows, there are lots of ways, lots of different lenses through which you can, you can look at pain. All right. Why is that not working? Hmm. Are you seeing this? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Now I see mine. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a few clicks, I find. Oh, there you go. It takes a couple. Okay. So you can look at pain through, through, through your body as a sign of physical injury. You can look at pain through the lens of your mind as a, a manifestation of uh, negative uh, thoughts and feelings. You can look at pain through the brain, which is I'll be talking a little bit about tonight. Uh, again, one of the big new developments in pain management, you can look at pain through the lens of trauma, which is another way of um, understanding pain. And each way has its, has its validity and each way adds a little bit more of a piece to the puzzle. Um, no, no one piece has all the truth. But I think the, the trauma pain connection is is a, a very useful lens to understand. It's not one that many people know much about and uh, explains an awful lot about chronic pain, why people have it and what they can do about it. And okay, so um, in this, appro in this um, approach, I'm going to show you how to use uh, different brain capabilities to manage pain so it's it's a there's two things we're looking at tonight trauma and the brain so the, the what are the main things that the brain does that i'm going to show you how to use attention memory imagination sensory processing and new learning so so we're really we're really approaching going to approach the problem of chronic pain from a trauma and brain informed path and you'll see that this enables you to uh, change your brain change your pain in the most efficient way first of all what what is trauma well we we prompt most of us would understand trauma as something that happens to soldiers or people who have been through very um, kind of life-threatening events but in actual fact um, as we've learned more about trauma, we've discovered that people who had uh, a lot of stress in their childhood, perhaps where there was domestic violence or a parent with a mental health, um, actually show up with very similar levels of anxiety and trauma to people who have been through combat situations. And we call these, these childhood antecedents of trauma adverse childhood experiences. And an adverse childhood experience can be uh, physical abuse, but it can also be uh, uh, conflict or, or domestic violence in the home, or just parents not being present to their children because they're uh, distracted by other things. Uh, so one of the definitions of abuse that not many people are aware of is is using a child to satisfy the emotional needs of a parent. So I, don't, I want you not to make waves. I want you to be a doctor. These kind of messages that children get are actually a form of 
abuse that subvert their emotional development and that and lead to stress that predisposes people to illness and injury. So there are three main types of um, adverse childhood experiences. One is abuse, uh, physical or emotional or sexual, which most people will be fairly familiar with. Another one is that is that neglect that I was talking about, which can be physical, but is often emotional. And the third one is just household dysfunction. If there's a, a relative in jail or there's divorce or there's domestic violence or a parent with a mental illness, all these things can create enormous stress in a child, which shows up in, in adult life. A phenomena we psychologists refer to as the body remembers. And so how does this affect you? How does it affect an adult survivor of childhood adversity? Well, they, they, they may or may not have a condition that's known as post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and the three main symptoms of that are that you feel stressed, tired, and scared. And this is how a lot of chronic pain sufferers really feel. They're never able to relax. They're in a state of constant tension. Their fight flight response is always going. You know, when's that next pain flare up going to happen? They're tired because they're just not getting any sleep because of the intrusion of pain on their sleep. And they're anxious. They're worried about how they're gonna cope, what's gonna happen, their future, their ability to work, et cetera, et cetera. And in a person with PTSD, these, these symptoms are um, added to with avoidance. Uh, people just don't feel safe to face any sort of challenges or stressful situations in life. They uh, have mood regulation problems. They're up and their mood is up and down. They're irritable. They may feel dissociated or disconnected or, or numb, just unable to smell the roses, depressed, guilty, shameful, and just bad about themselves. So uh, post-traumatic stress disorder isn't something that's restricted to combat veterans or victims of sexual abuse or rape. Um, it's uh, the symptoms of it can show up in lots of ways and lots of people. I'm, Mark, I'm struck by that list and how, you know, if you look at that list, it's, it very much sounds like the experience of, of chronic pain, doesn't it? Yes, like, yes. Exactly, but yeah, interesting, thank you. Exactly, whereas I don't think most chronic pain sufferers would identify themselves as PTSD sufferers. Right, right. Yeah. But, uh, uh, as you're about to see, um, there's a huge overlap between the two conditions. So um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder normally affects between five and 10% of, shall we say, people at the normal population. It's a, a sort of a, it's a significant percentage. But in chronic pain sufferers, the rates of post-traumatic stress disorder range from 20 to 50%. So it's very common in wow. chronic pain sufferers, affecting as much as one and two. And even if you don't have that diagnosis, as you saw from that previous slide, uh, chronic pain sufferers will have a lot of, this, of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and regardless of whatever else has happened to you in your life, chronic pain is traumatic. It, it's, it's, if it's not directly life-threatening, it certainly takes away your control, your sense of well-being, your ability to feel safe in the world and, and, and over a long period of time. Um, and um, of course, uh, if, if you have had a diagnosis of PTSD, then you're even more likely to have chronic pain. So again, that huge overlap between the two conditions. The other thing I just want to mention is attachment. And remember, we talked about adverse childhood experiences. So I just want to mention attachment because this is a concept that um, perhaps lay people aren't familiar with. But in psychology, attachment refers to the relationship that a child has with its parents. And it's really where we learn about ourselves and how to regulate our emotions. And if there are problems in our attachment, if our parents are abusive or neglectful or um, disturbed, then we learn that the world's not a safe place. 
that there's no one that we can turn to, to to feel safe to get our needs met and that results that, that causes stress in children and which they retain as they grow up and they look they have to learn to meet their needs in kind of maladaptive ways through addictive kind of behaviors or habits or workaholism pleasing others all things which are not good for your health and which um, really put a lot of stress and strain on your nervous system. So this is another factor that's very common in chronic pain sufferers. 75% of chronic pain sufferers have insecure attachment. Um, so that's, that's even more than PTSD. Um, attachment problems are not uncommon in the normal population. It's between uh, 40 and 50 percent so unfortunately um i didn't know that sorry to interrupt i, I did not know that what you just said or that yeah. 75 percent of people with chronic pain have an insecure attachment yeah, yeah. and it's, it's quite a common thing in the general population yes remarkably so unfortunately but um if you if you if you think about it um our parents or at least my parents grew up with the war, the depression. Uh, they were in, they were, they had their own traumas to deal with, and they were in survival mode. So they, they were, they were. If they put food on the table, well, they had done their job as a parent. And so it's, um, it's a generational thing. Um, maybe it's going to change with this generation, uh, which seems to be much more aware psychologically. But anyway, it's, it's uh, quite widespread and especially in chronic pain suffering. Oh, Mark, I just lost your video. I mean, your audio. Has anybody else lost it or is that just me? Yeah, I can't, I can't hear Mark. Either. Oh, there we go. No. Huh. Well, isn't that strange? Uh Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's my Wi-Fi connection. Apologies. Oh, I thought you said it was your wife. No, it's your Wi-Fi. Oh, my... <laughs> Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Okay. Okay. So, so just quickly. So, so the, these the, the, again. This this is how how trauma and advert and childhood stress leads to pain. You're you're in a state of constant stress. You're tired. You're anxious. You're having trouble coping with everyday life stresses. You're moody. Uh, you're disconnected from your feelings. Uh, there's depression, guilt, all the, all those things are going on. Not regardless of whatever injury or illness you had that started your pain. And so, what what really happens in the in the in your brain and in your nervous system is a dysregulation. Um, um, and there's, an, there's a, you know, the old biochemical imbalance. So stress causes um, decreased GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, which keeps everything in balance. And that causes uh, reduced um, neurotransmitters that regulate cell repair, cortisol, endorphins, dopamine, and serotonin, all of which regulate sleep, mood, uh, pain management, and... Um, your, your immune system functioning. So it would take, we could spend all day on this, but I just want you to know that there's a direct link between stress and alters and central alterations in central nervous system functioning that predispose a person to pain. And when they get sick, they get sicker than someone who doesn't have those stress related changes in their central nervous system. And just to give you one example of that, um, Again, we could spend all day on it, but one example is is the effects of stress on the cortis on cortisol and your immune system. So when you have an acute stressor, your cortisol levels are raised, and that actually suppresses inflammation and stimulates the reduce of endogenous opioids. So actually, in actual fact, when you're in an acute stress, your body is more able to resist pain. Unfortunately, when stress goes on for too long or chronic stress. Um, the cortisol levels decrease 
and the immune the immune immune system goes crazy and you get enhanced inflammation and reduced production of endogenous opioids so so chronic chronic stress is the problem really mm. We're not supposed to be in, under stress for a long period of time, I guess, eh? We're supposed to no. peak and then, yeah. Mm. That's right. We're not, we're just not designed and mm -hmm. we're not designed for that. So, mm -hmm. and just, just again, just to show you how, how it works. So one of the, one of the key um, causal factors or links between trauma and pain has found to be insomnia. And this is a picture of Margaret Thatcher, who is famously known as the Iron Lady, because she only had ever had five hours to sleep a night. Wow. And um, she was very proud of not needing more sleep. Unfortunately, this is how she ended up. Mm -hmm. So we, as I said earlier, we have a saying in psychology, the body keeps the score. You can get away with kind of lack of sleep and punishing yourself for a while. But, but uh, she ended up with Alzheimer's, as you can see there, and um, you know, not, not very well. Mm -hmm. the, other th the other effect of trauma is that it, it, that it creates bad, it makes you feel bad about yourself. Um, just there's something wrong with you. And that, that feeling, particularly in children who had adverse childhood experiences comes from um, you know, the parents not being available to them. And um, then children, when children's parents are not available in the way they need, children are faced with a very difficult choice. Do I think mum and dad have a problem? Or do I think that, or is it preferable to think that I've got the problem? And because their parents are the people they depend on for survival, the child tends to think they've done something wrong. And if they just be a better little boy or girl, mum and dad will will love them and look after them better so it's it's they it creates really shame a sense mm. of shame and that shame is is preferable to knowing or admitting that mum and dad aren't really there for me right that's so, such a, a if you have that feeling or that belief you you can almost guarantee it's it's a small child belief in there isn't it that that there's yeah, something yeah. there must be something wrong with me because you know I can't I don't have the capacity to say like these adults are not here for me that's right yeah. and so that and that child will learn to met to get their needs met uh, without needing people by being self-reliant by hiding their feelings um, perhaps they'll grow up to be someone who's tends who has a tendency to be addictions or overwork um, pushing themselves very hard, um, not admitting to having any needs, all of which, you know, creates a recipe for the development of chronic pain when they get injured or sick, because they're just, there's just too much wear and tear on the nervous system. Right. So that's how it starts. Now, what, now the question is, why, why, don't, why can't we see this? Okay. Tina Turner is a survivor of horrific childhood abuse and neglect and domestic violence. Her husband uh, beat her regularly, scalded her with hot coffee. She couldn't remember what it was, what it was like not to have uh, a black eye for years, but she fought not to be that person. Mm -hmm. She fought to be successful, to, to be a different person. And you can see in that image that she succeeded But Tina Turner, um, despite how healthy she, she looks, she has high blood pressure. She's had a stroke. She suffers from vertigo. She's had intestinal cancer and she's had a, tra a kidney transplant from kidney disease. So she doesn't, she's not as well as she looks. And, and the reason for that is, as, as I explained about the effects of stress on the brain, you often can't see what, what it's done to your body, it's invisible. Secondly, no one wants to admit that mum and dad weren't good or that they had a bad childhood. So they, they sort of block it out and forget it through a process called dissociation, and which, is, which one therapist describes as 
nature's tincture of numbing and forgetting. So we see in a lot of adult survivors of, shall we say, less than ideal childhoods, they, they're quite amnesic of their childhood. They just can't remember very much. And that's just their mind saying, let's just not remember what happened then. The other reason we can't see it is because society just doesn't want us to. Um, really, ever since the days of, of Freud, when he started discovering high incidence of sexual abuse, people who we, society in general pre pretend, prefers to pretend that these things just don't happen. And we've, so we've seen that now with the explosion of cases in the Catholic Church and the, and the awareness of, this, of the extent of this problem. But generally, it's something that's for a long, a lot of history has been kept out of mind, out of sight. The other, so that's true. That's that's the trauma stuff. The other, the other major development in our understanding and treatment of chronic pain in the last twenty years has been recognition of the role of the brain in pain. And you've probably already heard quite a bit about this, so I'm just going to keep this very brief. But um, that, that's a, that's, this is a summary of the areas of the brain that are mainly involved in pain. There are nine, there are nine areas that are, are involved in movement, emotion, memory, uh, fear conditioning, sensory processing. And of those nine areas that are involved in pain, in the experience of chronic pain, only two of them are involved in sensory and processing sensory input from the body. The other seven are to deal with thinking, feeling, remembering, uh, your, your fear response. So you can see that pain, um, pain is mediated by the brain and it's really, um, it's much more a sensory and an emotional problem than it is purely just a sensory problem, even though it feels like it's coming from the body. So what happens, what, what happens with the brain is that the brain remembers anything that it's, it's experienced repeatedly. And you can see what happens is that it's that less like pain pathways get sort of laid down in your brain something that Dan, a neuro, neuropsychologist Dan Siegel describes as neurons that fire together, wire together. So unfortunately for pain sufferers, the more often you experience something, the more your brain learns to feel that. And you get, it's like walking through the, the long grass in the same way all the time, those pathways get, those, get laid down and remembered. So what can we what can we do about it? Um, really, the the biggest development in pain management in the last few years has been the recognition of the role of the brain in, in pain, how that helps us understand it, and how that helps us develop more effective treatments for it. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to I'm going to introduce you to five brain smart pain strategies for controlling pain based on the understanding of pain as a product of the effects of past stress on the nervous system and brain functioning and some new understandings about the capacity of the brain to unlearn painful patterns of activity. Before we do that, there's a couple of things you need to know about your brain. Just like driving a car, you don't need to fully understand how your car works in order to operate it. But the, the more that you know, the better able you'll be to maintain your car. So let's take a look under the hood and review a couple of basic things about how your brain works in order to better inform the strategies that you're about to learn. So what, is it, what does your brain do? Up until recently, it was thought that the brain really just did two main things. It either reacted to stressful situations or it was in a state of no stress when, you know, when everything's okay, that there were these two, the brain really just had two main states of activity. And it, this, the, it did this through what's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve 
connects the brain to the body and vice versa. And it controls your fight flight response through the uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is on the right there. So that when you're, when you're tense or scared, you get accelerated heartbeat, um, uh, glucose gets converted, uh, uh, it gets the secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline, which is like cortisol, um, your, your appetite is decreased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is when you're in a state of calmness, your heart rate slowed down, your breathing's slower, um, you, you, you can stimulate a bile in your mouth to digest food, and so on. However, um, in the 90s, uh, a neuropsychologist called Stephen Porges discovered that there was actually a third state, and that is what's called shutdown. So when we're when we're in when we've been in chronic stress, we basically our nervous system shuts down. So this is called the polyvagal theory, which which re, which which really says that there are three states of arousal: calm, stressed, and numb, frozen, dead, shut down, overwhelmed, not feeling anything. And a lot of chronic pain sufferers. Uh, really, really vacillate between um, feeling anxious and feeling nothing. Mm -hmm. Because I just wanted to just reiterate that too. Just yeah, like how we talk, uh, <clears throat> you know, fight, flight, freeze. That are when you're yeah, in chronic okay. pain, it sounds like our nervous system finds it finds ourselves in there most of the time with chronic pain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So. so so this has implications for, for treatment and especially in terms of how we want to, what we want to stimulate in the brain. Uh, so for, the, uh, for anxiety, we want, we want to do things that help calm the nervous system down and bring you back into that calm state. But for shutdown, you want strategies that actually activate your nervous system and raise your mood and your energy levels. And they, 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 um, they involve different strategies. So for, for soothing things, you, you want things like meditation or, or supportive relationships or EMDR, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Whereas for activating the, the nervous system when you're frozen or numb, you want also you can use EMDR, which I'm going to show in a minute, or movement or exercise or play, more active kind of strategies. So this, this polyvagal theory really helps um, think about different kinds of strategies and, and when to use them to either, cut, so, so either put the brakes on or put the accelerator on, depending on what state you're in. Now, um, the, and the understanding of the polyvagal theory is already leading to some new treatments for chronic pain, one of which is to stimulate the vagus nerve through the ear, which is where the vagus nerve is accessible. And there are now devices on the market that, that where you can do that. But the research is really in very early stages about um, this approach and how effective it is. So I can't um, can't sort of make any bold statements about that yet, but it's it's an, some, something that's under development. Mm. So mind-body communication is two-way via the vagus nerve. The brain isn't a passive receiver of inputs from your body. It's also generating your reality. For example, if I ask you to think of biting on a lemon, and noticing the saliva being produced in your mouth when you think of doing that. Your brain just did that. You, don't, you haven't bitten on anything. Your brain just produced a visceral response without any external input. So that really proves the point about how your brain generates your reality. So, the, so you have two sets of pain pathways. You have bottom-up pain pathways, which is what's called nociception, when you when uh, pain signals are sent from your body to your brain, and they use 
um, uh, different special nerves called efferent fibers and, they, and special neurotransmitters called substance P and glutamate. We won't get too much into the science of that, but basically pain, and pain signals enter your nervous system via a, 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 a sort of a gateway at the bottom of your spine, spine called the pain gate. So that's bottom up. You also have top down. So um, top down is a different process. It's got to do with perception, your brain's interpretation of what's going on, your memory, because if you've been in pain, you remember what it's like and you're affected emotionally by that. And it goes, unlike the pain gate, it's going through a, uh, an area of the top of the brain called your periodactyl gray or PAG. And the periodactyl gray stimulates the release of, of noradrenaline and serotonin and also endogenous opioids. So the periodactyl gray can stimulate, uh, can be involved in the production of pain, but also in the relief of pain. So knowing that we have top down and bottom up pain pathways also means that we have top down and bottom up pain control strategies. So bottom up is things like behavior therapy or movement, sleep and diet, things that, things that involve the body, hot and cold stimulation, tense stimulation, EMDR and touch therapy or massage. You can, so whereas top down strategies are things like information, understanding pain, mindfulness, cognitive therapy, distraction, avoidance, imagery, hypnosis, a thing called pendulation, which I'm going to sh talk about shortly, and psychodynamic counseling. That's a really useful way of putting it, Mark, of uh, thinking about, um, you know, what, because it gives us so many opportunities to go yes. bottom up and top down. Thank you. Know, you. Lots, Thank of, you. lots of options, hey? Yes, exactly. So, um, you already know, uh, I would say if you, I would say most people know a fair bit about um, behavior therapy, self-care, um, the use of hot and cold stimulus, and also about mindfulness meditation and changing your thinking and distraction. And so I'm not going to talk about those things today. I'm going to, what I'm going to introduce you to is five new strategies that are based on trauma in the brain. This thing's just going a bit too fast for me, but I'm going to talk about EMDR. I'm going to talk about alternating attention, imagination, and how to retrain your brain. So uh, uh, these are these are new uh, bottom up and top down strategies. And these are the five strategies. I'm going to show you how to use alternating attention to manipulate your pain. I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to show you two strategies based on EMDR. I'm going to show you how to use imagery and uh, to to use your imagination to change your brain, change your pain and also how to use brain science. EMDR just as a quick introduction is stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing and it's a trauma therapy that uses um, a combination of focused attention and bilateral stimulation to really reprogram the fear responses that maintain trauma and pain and I'm going to show you how to use that in, a, in, a, in a, an, um, an element of EMDR to do that. So, so, alternate, so alternating attention. Remember what I said, uh, where attention goes, neural firing grows. So, it's, so attention is something that you can control. Um, when you're in pain, your attention tends to be based on or focused on the pain. But in actual fact, you can, you can, choose not to focus on that you can focus on other other things um, it's just that your attention tends to naturally be drawn towards things that are unpleasant or problems because your survival depends upon that 
but you actually have the ability to to manipulate your attention and to direct it where you want it will and wherever your attention is that is really what your experience becomes so so anyone who's done mindfulness knows about how to use attention to create you know feelings of relaxation and detachment from their problems Today, I'm going to show you how to use a different kind of attention, alternating attention, to change your pain experience. And alternating attention is just the ability to switch from one focus to another. And it's something that suffers a little bit in chronic pain suffers because when you're anxious and stressed, your, your attention becomes a bit sticky. It becomes sort of just focused on the traumatic or the stressful or the painful thing. And it's harder to get your attention off that thing. So this exercise is going to help unstick your attention and give you a bit more flexibility. And that will help you to change the way you feel. And then, Mark, I'm thinking about that slide you had of the pathways uh, through the field. And yes. would you say that when you're changing your attention that you're also um like create maybe walking a little bit in a different direction exactly uh, in, in a different exactly. pathway yeah that's okay. right that's right right so we're going to do an exercise now called pendulation which um i need i need um everyone just to get comfortable for a minute everyone who's listening and focus on where, as best they can, whatever discomfort or pain they're feeling in their body right now. And just get a sense of um, the size, the shape, the color, the temperature. Oh, I think we lost your audio, Mark. Yeah. Oh, we got a little bit, little bit glitchy. Now? Yeah, gotcha. Okay, so, so notice, just noticing the sensory qualities of your pain, noticing where you feel it in your body. And if you can, just getting an image of your pain. What, what's it feel like? What's it remind you of? And then once you've done that, I want you to put that aside for a moment and attend, pay attention to a part of your body where there's no pain, where you feel comfort. Just whatever comes to mind. And just notice how different that part of your body where there is no discomfort feels. Just how natural, how soft, how loose, how it feels there. And then when you've, when you've got an, an awareness of that part of your body that feels comfortable and okay, see if you can get an image of that. That's what that feels like, what it reminds you of. If you can, it's okay if you can't. And now I want you to bring your attention back to the area of your body where there's discomfort. But imagine as you bring your attention back that you're bringing with you a little bit of that comfort and relief that you, that you became aware of in that part of your body where there is no discomfort. And notice what it feels like now as you pay attention to that discomfort Oops. Looks like we just lost Mark. I'm just going to wait for him to come back in. 
Maybe you guys can just stay there in that place of bringing <clears throat> the no pain area into the area of discomfort. Oh, I think he might have lost his internet. Darn it. Yeah, I'd love to know um, how you how you found that exercise that he did just now. There he comes. Okay, I will make you a co-host, Mark. Hopefully, we can get Mark back. Mm-hmm. I think what he was saying was just so interesting and it, it really ties together a lot of what we've been discussing um, over the last few months, you know, mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Yeah. And just that connection between um, pain and trauma, but also um, attachment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was very, very interesting. At the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How we go here, Mark? Are you there? Uh huh. You're back. I'm back. You're back. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay. It's just one of those things so, when we're going across, halfway across the world. Yeah. So I, I can see a couple of comments. Some people were saying they were feeling better. Some they weren't. We're not actually finished yet. We're not actually finished yet. Okay. So so. So, so now I want people to take their, is that okay if I just keep going? Yeah, Absolutely. keep going, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, now, so now, now I want people to take their attention back to the area of comfort and, and no pain in their body and just notice that again. Pay attention to that area. Notice what it feels like. Just paying, paying attention as much as you can to that area of comfort and relief. And once you've got a good sense of that, bring your attention back to the area of discomfort again. And again, imagine that as you're bringing your attention back, back, you're bringing with you a bit of that comfort and relief. And then notice again, what it feels, how that area of discomfort feels now. And whatever you notice is just fine. There's no right or wrong here. And then one last time, I want you to, to put that aside and take your attention, draw your attention back to the area of comfort and relief and no pain. And again, noticing how different that feels, the softness, the looseness, the naturalness, the wellness of that. Just getting a sense of that what that feels like there, where that, that part of your body where, where things feel okay and and natural and then and then bring your attention back to the area of discomfort again and again imagine that as you're doing that you're bringing with you a, a sense of that comfort and relief and letting that contaminate that area of this of discomfort and pain and just noticing again your experience of that now and any differences or changes in the way you experience that And that, so that's called pendulation. And that, that, that's using alternating attention to really alter your perception of pain by bringing in different perceptions, by, by focusing on different areas of your body. Wow. Um, and you, you, you can um, actually find that exercise on my Overcoming Pain app. So there's a guided... Uh, meditation incorporating that right that was really interesting mark because I've, I've had people take their attention to a part of the body that has no pain the ones we forget about that are comfortable but i yeah. haven't done that pendulation back and forth and bringing those qualities uh -huh, into uh -huh. the painful area um yeah. so yeah just some really interesting uh comments yeah I, it sounds like uh -huh. something to <clears throat> if it 
you know, something to practice using your yes. attention. And it's different to mindfulness because you're using your experience to change the way you feel. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's active. Any, any feedback from the audience on that? Oh, yeah, a lot, lot. So um, okay. uh, amazing that worked. Uh, for one person, the pain was the same. Uh, somewhat helpful. Yes. It's worked. Definitely yeah. lessened. Um, uh, I still have pain, but it lessened. Um, balanced, like the two parts are halved. Um, uh -huh. Now pain altogether greatly reduced. Um, Great. The the temperature came down. Uh, one person said just to us, I can't believe I'm feeling so much relief. Really helpful. Oh, uh, fascinating. Right. Yeah, uh, interesting. Because we don't, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, so I, I'm, I've got to keep moving, but I would, I'd be, I'd be um, I'm pleased to hear that it helped a lot of people. Nothing works for everybody. So to that person who it didn't help, don't worry, there's more coming. And, and um, maybe if that person would like to contact me after the uh, meeting today or send you an email to me, I'd, be, I'd like to help perhaps help find out what's going on for them and see if we can help them a bit more. Excellent, thank you for that. Very welcome. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the, to the second of the five strategies now. Uh, let me get this up and going. So can, oh, can you see that? Yeah, EMDR. Yeah, reprogram the, the fear response. Yes. Yeah. So, so that, so, so, the fear, as we saw in the brain, as, we, as we've seen so far, the, the, um, the fear response is a huge, and the emotional response to pain is a huge component of pain, mm -hmm. and EMDR is a. Um, a really powerful way of turning off the fear response. Um, basically, uh, EMDR involves many elements, but at, at its core is a process of focused attention plus bilateral stimulation. And in trauma sufferers and in increasingly in chronic pain sufferers, that stimulates a relaxation response and decreased uh, symptoms of anxiety and pain. And the way the way it how does that work? Well, very quickly, it's thought to be activating something called the orienting response. So the orienting response is your inbuilt response to novel stimuli. So whenever, you whenever your nervous system detects a novel stimuli, the, the orienting response is activated and the orienting response is going, is this something that I have to worry about or something I don't have to worry about? And uh, when you activate the orienting response, there's actually an increase in arousal. But after, after it, re it recognizes that it's not a problem, your, your nervous system relaxes. So in, in actual fact, when we're using the orienting response, we're hijacking your fight flight response. And if you remember, we talked about um, the, we'll talk a bit about the amygdala, which is responsible for your fight flight response and the periodactyl gray, which is responsible for the shutdown. Um, so, so remember we talked about when you're in a shut, when you're in an anxious state, that's your amygdala that regulates that. And when you're in a shutdown state, that's your periodactyl gray. So the periodactyl gray is that organ at the top of your spine that regulates your pain. Um, so, and just the idea of the brake and the accelerator. So when we, when we use EMDR, what EMDR does is it deactivates your amygdala and it stimulates your periodactyl gray. So when, the, when your amygdala is deactivated, you have less fear and stress. And when your periodactyl gray is activated, you're, it helps stimulate endorphins and enkephalins, which is your body's natural opioids. So EMDR is a very direct, through the through bilateral stimulation, a, a very direct route into your nervous system to to turn off the fear response and to turn on your body's natural pain control abilities. So we're going to do we're going to do a little a little bilateral stimulation exercise now, and um, see see again see how see what this see what people notice. So for this exercise, 
All I want people to do is to focus on their pain again, like you did before, or discomfort, or whatever you're feeling in your body. And then listen to this to, to some, some audio bilateral stimulation, which I'm going to play for about a minute or so. And when, when you once you start listening to the audio bilateral stimulation, you don't have to do anything or try and make anything happen. Just listen to the bilateral stimulation and let your nervous system respond however it wants to respond to. There's no right or wrong. Your brain will do it all for you. So focusing on your pain or discomfort now, listening to the BLS and letting whatever happens, happens. That's it, just noticing. Just noticing. Just noticing whatever you notice. Just noticing whatever you notice. Okay, so we're going to pause it there and just bring yourself back to awareness and just notice, just notice how you feel in your body now and look out for a couple of things, three, th three things you may notice. One is a change in your pain levels. Second one, whether or not you notice a pain in your a change in your pain levels, just an increased sense of relaxation in your whole body or and or thirdly, a kind of decrease in mental activity, just like your brain's in a sort of more in a state of quietness, that there's just less of that worry and rumination that often accompanies chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Any any responses to that, Madeline? Um, a pain location changed, and uh, that's what I noticed as well. Um, oh, yes, decrease. Yes in uh, the brain uh, pain move, decrease in brain activity, uh, decrease in mental stimulation, calmer mind, pain eased. Uh, for one person, pain became sharper and more intense, uh, which sometimes happens. Um, yes. Relaxation, um, a pain increased as it went on. Uh, a couple of sharp okay. pain. Um, Okay, that that'll sorry just just because of the time that that's good. Yeah. That's a, so that's the full that's the full sort of range of responses you would expect. Um, for the people whose pain increased, uh, there's something there's something coming up which will be better be better for them, and that's the point of this. That nothing works for everybody all the time, and right. we, that's why we have different top down and bottom up strategies, and you've got to find everyone's got to find what works for them and it's it's everyone's different so it's really important you know for folks to feel comfortable about that and not to worry uh, nothing nothing works for everybody all the time yeah absolutely right. and the interesting thing was that those pings had an effect on our nervous system yeah 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 all right so so then so the next exercise is um, we're going to you for those for those of you for whom it worked. We're going to use your responses to that exercise to create um, a, a basically a pain antidote. So, right. no, so right. no, normally we're used to thinking about healing lights and uh, anesthetic mists and trying to visualize things to make us feel better. 
this, what we're going to do now is we're going to use those feelings of relief that those of, the, of you that found that helpful experienced to actually create a pain resource for you. So for those of you for whom it, who, who felt relief, what I want you to do now is just notice any, you know, whatever sense of relief or relaxation that you, you felt, notice where you feel that in your body and what that feels like, softer, looser, uh, just increased sense of well-being, the nerves just less excited, just noticing whatever you notice about that and especially how it feels, the sensory qualities of that. And what's that like? What is that? What do those feelings remind you of? Just getting an image in your mind of, of that encapsulates those feelings of relief. And then if there's a thought that goes with that image and those feelings, what that thought would be, I can feel better. I can let go of my pain. I can, I can learn to control my pain, whatever thought it is. And then I'd just like you to hold that awareness, those feelings and that thought in your mind and listen to the bilateral stimulation for another few seconds and just, just notice what happens now. That'll do. Have a rest, take a deep breath. And any feedback on that? Hmm. Let's see. And that was, this is a top down, isn't it? EMDR. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, now EMDR, the first one was bottom up, just oh. the bilateral stimulation, but the second one is top down. Okay, because Sorry, right, because we're using our thoughts. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah right so it's like um <laughs> I, yeah for georgie is the it's the sound itself <laughs> that's okay crazy. that's fine that's fine yeah, yeah. Mm. relaxing is anyone able yeah yeah uh, meditative my pain was the same but more pain in my toes oh Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay. relaxing positive breathing slowed really loved it had joy uh, found the Good. tone changed, soft to sharp first time, both sharp second time. Was that was that right, or yeah. were they the same? That's same same tones. Oh, yeah. interesting. So something, something's going on in their brain. Uh huh. Well, definitely. Yeah. No more pain. Relaxing mm -hmm. with the visualization. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that was interesting for me as well. Yeah. Georgie, Georgie, don't worry. You're not the odd one out. Not everybody has the same uh, uh, experience. <laughs> no, not at all. And what I, what I want to say is that we're doing this fairly quickly. There mm -hmm. are more, there are kind of more um, elaborate versions of most of these exercises on my Overcoming Pain app, uh, which will give people more time, yeah. uh, more time to do it properly. I'm just kind of giving you a little sampler today because of the time we have. Yeah, I love this. I love these uh, just uh, samples of EMDR. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, for the people who didn't respond, um, that may, by the way, I didn't explain, but generally what that means is that your nervous system is in a depleted state and it needs more support bef uh, before it can respond to these strategies. That's why, and that's why some of them have reported increased pain. They're in that their their nervous systems are overloaded. They're very tired, and there isn't enough energy in their system to for it to, to generate a positive response to the EMDR. And so that's very, that's interesting. And also, I noticed like the bilateral tone. It reminds me of the the EMDR lights moving from one side to the other. Yes, that seems to be a yeah. And that's an interesting sort of mm -hmm. yeah, correlation. Thank yeah, you. is it the is same, it, yeah. Mark? Uh, is it the same process with? Um, uh, yes, it's the same the process. Light? It's the same process. You can use either or. Um, 
I, I, I do think that the audio is more visceral, that you feel it, and it kind of hits you physically more mm -hmm. than the eye movement, which is kind of more mm -hmm. uh, kind of out there, mm. you know? Interesting, yeah. But yeah. Um, you can use either, or tapping for that matter. Right. Um, so, for, so, so for the, so again, we've got to use what, you know, offer different strategies for different people, depending on what they need. So the next strategy will be, uh, we're going to sort of, um, you're going to use imagination this time. And this will be good for the people who, who didn't respond, who didn't get perhaps a, a positive response to the EMDR, because this is less taxing on the nervous system. All right, but and it'll also be beneficial for the people who who did. So so, Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, and we're all born with an imagination. It, unfortunately, it gets bashed out of us by the education system, but everybody has an imagination, and it's something that never leaves you, and it's something you know if you suffer from any sort of adversity in life, you really need. To, to recapture. So, uh, we've talked about attention and how attention is um, a kind of a, a spotlight that, that really guides your awareness and your reality. So what I'd like you to, people to do for me now is to pay attention to um, their pain again, like they did before just noticing where they feel in their body and what it feels like. The qualities of it. And then take that pain and put it just outside your body, just a couple of inches away. Just move it outside your body. Just put, placing that pain just outside your body, just the way you can move your attention from inside to outside. And if you can do that, notice what, what it feel, how it feels different inside your body where the pain was before. And then take your attention back out to the pain, to the discomfort, and bring it back in and put it back where it was before. And notice as you do that now, whether it feels the same or different to how it felt where it was there before. And then take your, take your attention outside of your body again, carrying the pain with it. And this time, imagine you can place the pain a little bit further away from your body. Just seeing, seeing the pain sitting outside your body and noticing what, how it feels different inside your body now where the pain was there before. As that pain sitting outside your body there now. That's right. Now bring the pain back in, putting it back where it was before, noticing how it feels there again now. Any differences in how it feels compared with how it felt before. And now take the pain back out again, and this time putting it a little bit further away. And this time I want you to imagine a treasure chest, a, a steel box, a, a, a very solid box with a lid on it. Very secure the iron clasps. Now you can open that lid and you can put that pain inside it, inside that box. And close the lid and lock it. And put that box somewhere safe. Somewhere where you can find it if you need it, but somewhere where it's out of mind. Just put in that box with your pain in it away somewhere. Bringing your attention back to your body. And noticing what you feel in your body now.
Any differences in what you notice? And then when you're ready, you can take a deep breath and just return to wakeful awareness. Any feedback or comments on that one? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I I definitely felt like it was it was um, yeah, just like somebody else says, the body sp the space felt hollow, and when yes. we went back into yes. the body, it felt porous. That's exactly how I felt. Back and forth resulted in smaller areas of pain in my body. This one worked best for me. Um, uh -huh. Bottom line, pain gone much better worked well. Uh, someone struggling with this one, uh, sure, can't get sure. pain out of my neck and shoulders, um, feels much better, uh, struggle with imagination, uh, felt the pain leave, um, uh, pain is overwhelming still. Some people are having some high pain days right now. Yeah. The, the, all of these exercises are uh, best done on 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 low to moderate pain days on, on high pain days you need activities that require short concentration span such as distraction avoidance or very brief um, hypnotic suggestions these are these are too long for that for them mm, that's a that's a good okay. point yeah. yeah or even smaller smaller parts of this like yeah yeah, like, yeah 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 so, so for them, it would be better if they did these things on days when they were not too bad and got good at it, and then they can bring it in on the days when they're not so good. But it's a bit hard to learn this stuff fresh off the, off the, you know, off the table on a bad day. Right, right. It's yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Georgie lo loved this one. <laughs> okay. Good. So you're not the odd one out on this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With, uh, I think I told you, Mark, with our Empowered Relief, we have a binaural um, audio uh, meditate, tape, um, yeah. binaural meditation. And um, yeah, that we also encourage people to use on, start on low pain days and uh, yeah. work your way up. Yeah. yeah. With, the, with the person who said that their pain didn't, you know, they couldn't get it out. That means that, that, what what we would, what I would do if they were in my, my client and therapy would I'd be exploring what it is that's stopping them from letting go of the pain and that that would tend to suggest that there's a subconscious need to have that pain that it's that there's a part of them that's afraid that there's perhaps there's some injury that hasn't been diagnosed or treated or there may be a subconscious part of them that believes that they deserve to suffer. Um, we, we, we would need to work to find out what the block is to be able to do that. Or well, the pain just could, yeah. be, could be too high. Um, so all, 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 yeah. all of these exercises require, uh, some of them require assistance to be effective. Right, right. That, that makes and sense to get to the I, 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 No one should ever feel like a failure because something doesn't work. You know, it just Absolutely. means that they haven't found the right conditions for that to work. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. how, yeah. Are you ready for a question or do you want to zoom along? You can you can throw a couple of, I've got one more, but we can take a couple okay. of questions. Sure, All right. sure. Um, I, how often a day would you do these? Um, when it's your, if you're at work or it's not always, uh, you know, a good time to use them, what do you recommend? Um, what I generally tell my clients to do is to um, practice them at home and get good at them. And then actual fact, you can do, uh, you can do the pendulation exercise, for example, or the resource or the BLS very quickly, you know, kind of anywhere, anytime. Um, they're not, it's not like meditation where you have to do it for an hour every morning and build up that meditation mm -hmm. muscle. This is stuff that you do you know, really on an as need basis, but the, but like anything, the more you do it, the better, you know, the more your brain get, you know, those pain pathways get replaced. So the more you do it, the better, but, but you, um, you've got to, you know, it's really, it's really an individual thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Um, There's no hard, no hard and fast rule. 
no hard and fast rule. Let's find out what works. And it doesn't matter if it's muscle spasms or neuropathic pain or because pain, pain is, is still all in the brain. So yes. Yeah. With, with, mus with muscle spasms and neuropathic pain, the next exercise um, will be um, interesting for you guys um, because you really, you really want to, we really want to retrain the nervous system to reduce the level of excitation that's producing those muscle spasms or those neuropathic pain flare-ups. And um, in, in addition to all the other things that you're doing, the next exercise will really show you how to sort of start changing, retraining your brain to do that. Now, the next exercise is not someone, not something you'll feel immediately any relief from. It's more of a long-term exercise. But I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll we'll go to that. Okay, I think um, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, okay. Excellent. Where do, where do I sign up? That was a question. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell us how to how to uh, get a hold of you at the end. Okay. Sure. Sure. I'll, I'll give you the de those details. So so the last last but not least, um, I'm going to. Um, uh, this is this what you're looking at is a generic fmri image of the brain in pain and i looked at hundreds of brain scans of people in pain and it doesn't matter what kind of pain you have they all all look pretty much like what you're seeing here and some researchers in america and england a few years ago uh, basically sat chronic pain down sufferers down in front of an fmri and um, gave them really, really, really um, gave them some instructions to change their pain in the fMRI. And um, after uh, after just doing that a few times a day, uh, fifty percent, uh, sorry, eight eight of of the thirteen subjects were, had were able to reduce their pain by fifty percent in one day. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the study. 23% uh, of subjects reported an enhancement in their control over their pain intensity, and 30% were able to reduce their pain unpleasantness. So, um, I've created uh, there's a I've created um, my own fMRI, um, which show which really takes you from um, that state of brain pain activity to a state of calmness and um, sympathetic parasympathetic arousal levels so i'm going to i'm just going to show you uh, what that looks like now so we're going to have to do another share screen thing mm -hmm. um is that playing i can hear it yeah can you see it oh, oh uh okay. no. no hang on i can hear it but can't see it mm -hmm. um, just, i've got a um New share. All right, let's do that. Now, okay, I'm just wondering for people who don't know what an fMRI is as a functional. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you can tell just, them. Yeah, that's okay. Yes. Why don't you? Yeah, can you, you see that now? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, fun yeah. okay. So this is an, a, a so it's a functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it's really a picture of the of the blood flow in the brain that's associated with. Um, brain activity. And so this is what an fMRI of your brain and pain look, looks like. And I, I've tried to create what the researchers did on my pain app. Um, and and um, you, if you look, you look at this, uh, I'll, I'll play it and then we'll talk about it. All right. So I'm just going to give you a minute of this. So I just want everyone just to tune in, relax. Imagine that you're looking at a picture of your pain. Sorry, can you hear that? I heard it and then it stopped. Yeah, I just I just stopped it. Yeah, okay, here we go. Okay. Mm, I don't think we're hearing it, Mark. Okay, let's see what we're gonna do here. I've mm. got audio. Yeah? Okay. All right. So yeah. Um, dun, dun, dun. It, it was almost like it was there, and then it and then it uh, 
I wonder if it's just not coming through. Yeah, try that. No? It's, it's kind of glitchy. I can hear something and then it goes away. Um, dun, 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 dun. So it, it almost sounds like a, like a transmission thing. Is it playing now? It's moving, but I'm not hearing. Yeah, the visual is good, but not the audio. No audio? Uh, no. And, uh... Wait. What is it supposed to sound like? <laughs> is it? Oh, music, A music. Oh, okay, no, no. Okay, all right. Well, well we might oh. have to, oh. Somebody else said they they're hearing it. So maybe it's just- Okay. Have you got your, yeah. Yeah, maybe just play it and, and we'll see if we go along. Hmm. No. Anyway, so you can, uh, I, I guess you can see the, the, the point. Yeah, we could see the image changing. Yeah, so so that that's right. So if you the idea is that if you it's kind of like neurofeedback that if you if you look at that repeatedly, several times a day over a few weeks, that you're really retraining your you know those um, uh, pain pathways in your brain. You won't feel anything immediately. You won't even feel anything after a week of doing that, but after a month of doing that, together with the other things you know that I've been talking about, mm -hmm. things you know it really start to look a bit different okay so the idea was that the images are changing and you kind of imagining that it's your own pain yeah yeah oh i get it yeah and, and then you, so you're basically retraining your brain right but you know what looking, I, at the, I, looking at images. yeah if you sent that to me, I might be able to send it out to, for people to uh, look at after as a, sure. as a sampling. It is, it, is also, it is also available on my Overcoming Pain app, that, that, okay. that session. All right. Okay. So uh, any, so that, so that's, that, 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 that app has a collection of bottom up and top down strategies. Okay, and that is overcoming overcoming pain. Yeah. All right. And right now, are we supposed to be seeing anything here? Yeah, you see, I'm screen sharing. Are you seeing the, the seeing my slideshow? No. Okay, we'll have to go back to um... oh, new share. Hang on, new share, new share. Yeah. Now. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. So so yeah. so that yeah. that that video is on that app. Okay. Okay, interesting. Um, coupled, yeah, coupled with a guided sort of meditation. All right. Um, okay, excellent. Now, just because we're, we're um, um, so that's uh, that's one of so that it has a whole lot of a lot of stuff on it. As part of a series of apps I've created for helping people cope with the effects of traumatic stress for anxiety, sleep, pain, and self-esteem. Okay. Um, obviously because of the overlap between those four conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just my have book. a question about that, Mark. Can you, yeah. you, like when we're talking about pain and trauma, um, you could use the ones for, obviously, the ones for stress are going to help with pain, and the ones Correct. for pain will help with stress because we're talking about the same yep. um, pathways and the same part yeah. of the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. That's my book, and that's where you can get more information. Okay. So if anybody wants to get a hold of Mark after uh, today, overcomingpain.com. So can contact um, me through there. Okay, that's uh, that's great. 
All, all of the exercises that we've done today are on the Overcoming Pain app. Okay. And obviously the instructions are on there and um, yeah, so, uh, how yeah, to use yeah. it. Oh, you've done a lot of work on this in this area over the past couple of decades, obviously. Yes, it's um, a lifelong passion, really. And um, so it's an area where it's a very exciting area with these new developments with uh, brain science, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, it's, <clears throat> it's offering a lot of hope for sufferers. The, you know, new, new methods like stimulating the polyvagal nerve uh very you know uh, very exciting alternatives to opioids and medication and you know more traditional methods yes absolutely i i'm really i am uh, i'm and i you know i'm very hopeful for the future for people who suffer with chronic pain looking at where you've been around a little bit longer in this field than i have but um but looking at where it's come from <clears throat> to even to to now um mm. Yeah. So there was a question about um, functional neurological disorder. And um, yes. are you familiar with that? And would it be helpful for, for that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. Because it's again. Functional it's neurological yeah. disorder. Yeah. Function, obviously, it's, it, that, that's pain that is unmet psychological need. Um, that's that's or that's a manifestation of unexpressed emotional distress, and of course we all we all somaticize when we're stressed or when we can't express our feelings or when when we feel cornered in a, in a situation. And the key thing with functional pain, if you like, is that we've got is that can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh no. Yeah. Sorry, but the key thing there is to find oh, right? the key thing with functional pain is to find out what it is that the person's system needs in order to feel safe or, or what need the pain is representing. And you can you can do that with hypnosis or you can do it consciously, but the the person's system won't really allow them to let go of till that that unmet need is recognized and addressed. Mm. That's, that's interesting. The key. Wow. That's very interesting. Wow. Isn't that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought? That's the first time we've had kind of had that brought up here and uh, such a, un, uh -huh. a, um, a missed thing. Yeah. Oh, I think we made him. Oh, <laughs> I think we've, we've, we've lost him again. Yeah. You uh, think so? Okay. Yeah. He seems so, so frozen there. He's frozen. We'll just keep, I just, I have found this talk so interesting um, mm -hmm. just in terms of um, when I started practicing EMDR, oh gosh, 15 years ago, Mark's been doing it longer than I have. And people thought, people thought I was crazy because it's an unusual treatment and it involves moving your eyes back and forth or having these, you know, pings on either side while you think of, while you bring up the trauma. Uh, but since then, it really has become, yeah, let's stop it. It's really become a standard treatment for trauma, along with a lot of other things. Um, oh, mm -hmm. is my audio out? Is, or can people no, you're hear good. me? You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, for uh, injuries, for accidents, for trauma, and also mm -hmm. now for pain because it acts directly um, on the brain. And along with other things now, such as you may have heard of tapping, somatic experiencing, trauma release, um, all kinds of ways. So I really encourage anyone who is here tonight that there he's back. <laughs> hey, Mark. Yeah, Anybody? absolutely. Oh. I just get you to unmute. Um, anybody who who has kind of resonated with part of Mark's talk around trauma, um, to, I really encourage you to you know either you know look look for someone who treats trauma. Um, Mark, would you say should be well versed in trauma and pain? Um, yes, if, I mean unfortunately there aren't so many of those people around in my experience, but. 
No. I, um, um, I, I would I would say that for a lot of chronic pain sufferers, really what they need more than pain management is trauma, trauma mm -hmm. informed therapy. Mm -hmm. um, there's, mm -hmm. there's, so, there's so much trauma and going going on. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah, Chris, you had some interesting things happen here. I'm, I'm, yeah, pleased that you shared. Um, yeah, I have to agree with you. Like treating the trauma and the self regulation, the soothing that you talked about, you, mm. you know, uh, down regulating or up regulating the nervous system really is it's key. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Um, so there was, oh, eye technique or the sounds for EMDR. You, you say you prefer using the sounds. Am I right? Yes. I, I, I think they have a bigger impact on the nervous system viscerally than eye movements. But, so I, I recommend the sound for pain and the eye movements for trauma. Oh, that's interesting. That's okay. very interesting. Yeah. 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 Try um, that out. And obviously, the sound is a lot easier to do at home on your own with an i with a, an iPhone or something than the this than than, than this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, so you don't have to have any equipment, you know. Yeah. yeah. But they right. they work they work equally well, and whatever people prefer. Okay. Um, well, maybe we're, we're right at 7.30 our time. Uh, one, we have one quick question and I imagine it's a, a straightforward. Wonder if these techniques can help a person with a broken back and hardware that was placed in the back after the accident 10 years ago. I don't think trauma has a time on it, does it? <sighs> no, um, these, these can help someone with anything, but, um, uh, 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 and a, you know, a broken back is a broken back, but how much of that pain is, you know, is being perhaps inflated by stress, uh, by fear, by anxiety, by God knows what medical traumas she's been through or he's been through. Um, so um, I find that people who have had, you know, serious injuries like that, that, that that's not the only thing that's maintaining their pain. Mm -hmm. and, and while you can't fix you know, a broken back with your mind, you can certainly do a lot with the psychological, emotional, you know, ramifications of that and help that person to have um, at least a bit less pain and suffering and better quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time and then we're gonna let you get on with the beginning of, of the rest of your day. Um, just uh, a lot of a lot of thank yous um, a lot of you know very interesting uh, everything resonated great tools yeah. and so this is being uh, recorded so you'll you will get the replay and uh, you can go back and, and check out the tools that um, that we practiced and I am so pleased that we were able to bring this um, over mm -hmm. to us here in Canada and um, again, I really want to thank Mark. Uh, just, just great work. Thank you so much for sticking mm -hmm. with it. You know, EMBR for so long because <laughs> it works. Yeah. It's powerful, powerful. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, just a couple of uh, a couple announcements. Just next week, don't forget we have Mary Ellen coming back for um, grief and loss and um, coping with changes through chronic pain. And if there's any questions at all, uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me by email or if there's something for Mark, I can um, certainly ask him that Mark Grant, Mark Grant, I meant. <laughs> oh, Mark. Yeah, I'll, no. I'll deal with some of the questions. How's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, Mark, thank you very, very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. I think your way of presenting and just the way you put it together really tied up or tied together and brought together a lot of some of the things that we've been discussing and the concepts over the last few weeks. It was really, very much appreciated. Thank you. And we look forward to, to perhaps seeing you again sometime in the future. Thank you very Maybe. much. My and pleasure, from, Mark. from the clinic, Maybe. thank you. It's been fantastic. Have a, have a good rest of your day. I nearly said evening, but you know, I'll have a good rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.